Welcome everyone to this webinar on Emerging Trends and Methods in International Development Evaluation. My name is Laura Peck and I'm a Principal Scientist at APT Associate Social and Economic Policy Division where I oversee evaluations of U.S. social welfare policies and programs. Uh, and also at APT, I have the privilege of being the global lead for our research monitoring and evaluation capabilities. And that has me looking across all of our portfolio of work globally to ensure that we are bringing the best of our capabilities to the world's challenges in support of our mission, which is to improve the quality of life and economic well-being of people worldwide. So before we get started, um, we'd like to learn a little bit about you and why you're here. Um, and so in the chat panel, uh, there we go, I will um, post a link, oh, maybe. <laughs> I will post a link in just a moment here um, to a poll where I will have you um, There we go, um, where I will have you uh, click to the poll. And uh, there are two questions there that will allow us to learn a little bit more about you. And while you take that poll, um, let me share with you the agenda for how the webinar will proceed. First, Sebastian Lemire will present on emerging trends and methods that have relevance specifically to international development evaluation. And then two colleagues, uh, experts in international development evaluation and M&E, will reflect on Sebastian's presentation from each of two perspectives. Betsy Ness Edelstein will consider implications from the perspective of U.S. funding agencies and interests. And Umbuso Jama will consider the implications from the perspective of U.S. and U.K. <laughs> funding agencies and interests. And thereafter, we'll take questions from all of you to dis discuss further issues that interest you. Um, so I'm assuming that you've now had time to take the poll, so I'll turn it to my colleague Lauren, who's here to provide our tech support to, to share the poll results. Um, and looks like some are still coming in. Great. Okay, so the, the largest share of you is in the uh, nonprofit, non-governmental organization um, category in terms of where you work. Um, and let's look at the, the next answers, which are about how much do you know about evaluation? Well, this is fantastic. Um, no one knows nothing at all, and uh, very few know everything. Uh, so I'm hoping that the little bit and the lot will um, we'll maybe nudge some of you into the everything category after we uh, get a chance to hear from, from Sebastian. Okay, great. If you want to go back to the, to the slide, Lauren, um, let me just let you know that uh, to engage you in the discussion as well, we would like you to pose any questions that you have in the chat, and you can direct them to all panelists, and we'll aim to tackle as many of those as we can uh, after the after the presentation and discussion. And also along the way, for people who want a deeper dive into any given subject, I'm gonna be putting some links into the chat um, for you where that will allow um, you to connect to some additional relevant resources that align with the discussion. So look for that. And with that, I will turn it over to Sebastian Lemire. Thank, thank you, Laura. How could we possibly have uh, an evaluation talk without some real-time data collection? Um, thanks to all the people joining today's conversation. Um, it's a rainy, gray day here in Washington. Uh, just a perfect morning to grab a cup of coffee and then talk evaluation. So Lauren, let's dive right into that first slide. Um, over the years of my own practice and interest in, in reading about evaluation, um, I've noticed that the range of evaluation approaches, designs, and methods have grown substantially. Uh, the evaluator toolbox just continues to grow. Um, as a way of organizing my own thinking about all the different options I have as an evaluator, uh, I recently developed this metro map of, of evaluation. Uh, the map really consists of, of three main lines. There's a line for 
study designs. There's a yellow line in the middle for theory-based evaluation where most of my own practice is situated. And then there's also a line for uh, utilization, uh, each of which are, of course, uh, central lines to evaluation practice and profession. There are also emerging lines. So I added some emerging lines for things that are sort of uh, starting to gain traction in evaluation practice. And then I, I labeled each, stage, each, each of the metro stations according to a specific, specific approach to evaluation or design or a method. And to the extent possible, I, I try to sort of locate stations that are in proximity or in the same line that are sort of related to one another. Now, when I talk about evaluation approaches, uh, I, you know, some people refer to these as evaluation theories or models. Um, what they do is, is they prescribe how and with what purpose we conduct our evaluations. So it's just one example. I do a lot of theory-based evaluation and that approach as an umbrella term for a lot of different actually variants of theory-based evaluation, this, the shared idea is that we structure our evaluation around the development and empirical uh, refinement of a program theory. Study designs are a little bit different. Uh, the way I use them in my Metro map, they specify the overarching structure of the data collection. So they specify whether we include a control group or not, uh, where we place the measurement points in relation to the intervention that we're evaluating and so forth. And then we have methods, which I use as a term for the ways in which we collect and analyze data. So examples could be uh, a survey or an interview would be a method to me, um, but also different strategies for analyzing the data, uh, such as running a regression analysis or doing thematic coding. Now, there are, of course, many, many ways to develop these maps and many, many ways to organize our thinking around what's going on in evaluation. I encourage you to adopt and adapt uh, this type of uh, map for your own thinking. I'm certainly revising it based on feedback that I'm getting. Um, and to be sure, this map is already incomplete. Uh, as I'll go on to discuss today, new lines and stations have already emerged. So let's go to the next slide, Lauren. Now, it's of course an impossible task to cover all the trends and developments in evaluation in just a short amount of time. So what I'm planning to do today is just focus my talk on what I take to be three major trends or mega trends that shape our practice. So these are major movements and shifts that will influence both our, has already started to influence our practice and profession. And within each of those uh, major trends, I'll talk about some of the approaches and methods that we have available, um, but also sort of try to peek into the future a little bit and uh, maybe not predict what will happen, but what I would like to see happen in, in the future practice. Uh, throughout my presentation, I will uh, make references to this excellent IEG methods source book that Jos Vasen, Papa Befani, and I, uh, in collaboration with a lot of other IEG staff and other consultants, uh, have just released uh, at the end of last year. Um, it provides a very easy, easy, easily accessible introduction to a lot of the methods and approaches that I'll be talking about today. It, and, and it's free. And, uh, you know, I just think it's really a great read on a Sunday morning. Family is still sleeping, coffee in hand, just the perfect way to ease into a Sunday. Now, let's go to the first trend, which I'm sure will not be too surprising to many of the more experienced and uh, well-versed evaluators. The first major trend I'd like to discuss is big data analytics. I really think there are sort of two uh, trends here. There's one, the rapid growth in the availability and accessibility of information and communication technology, which has opened up just a whole range of avenue for data collection uh, relevant to that evaluation. Um, and of course, you know, enlisting these types of technologies and new data sources, uh, allows us to, um, you know, it increases our the feasibility and reach of our data collection as part of evaluations. It also expands access to remote areas that would otherwise be difficult to reach with classical, more traditional approaches for data collection. And in some cases, it can also provide real-time or at least more readily updated uh, data for analysis. 
uh, we're doing a lot of work on, on, on this kind of work at Apt Associates. Um, now, in extension of these emerging technologies, uh, data science, uh, so actually integrating and analyzing and, and, and managing these large volumes of data, um, sometimes from multiple sources, sometimes unstructured data, also opens up a whole range of, um, of options for evaluators. Now, on this slide, I included the Gartner hype cycle, which is depicted as a red line, and it really illustrates sort of the different stages of hype surrounding the emergence of a new technology. Uh, for big data and evaluation, I think the big trigger was at the, with the release of the Global Pulse paper in 2012, and the, the keynote at the EES, the European Evaluation Society Conference of that same year. As I recall, evaluators were sort of divided in two camps. They were both excited, but also nervous. What does all this big data analytics mean for evaluation? Are we being replaced by data, big data analysts? Uh, what are the ethical uh, consequences? What about quality? So it was sort of a mixed, mixed response. And I think what has happened since then, and through more publications, both by the UN Global Pulse, their first book on big data and evaluation published in 2017, and now we're starting to see what uh, Gartner would say as a sort of a plateau of productivity, where we actually see case applications being published. The first one was published in the journal Evaluation a couple of years back from Norway. Um, but I see as part of the uh, methods guide and working on the methods guide book, Yoz, Barbara and I, and we had identified more than 20 uh, case applications and there's surely more to come. Let's go to the next slide. And I think developing more real world examples, instead of just talking about big data being a good idea, actually showing what good big data analysis looks like in evaluation is tremendously important because it basically allows us to better appreciate both the benefits and the limitations of emerging technologies and big data analytics in the specific context of evaluation. The IEG recently uh, released a blog uh, that was motivated by the COVID crisis, but it had a really nice decision tree that, you know, is just one of those tools that I like to have in my office, just to remind me always to think about and think through the extent to which I should be doing, pursuing big data uh, as part of my evaluation work. It's a nice little reminder and the questions are just uh, really well thought out. Um, one of the things that I see a lot happening right now in the big data movement is in terms of uh, text mining and natural language processing. Uh, recently at APT, uh, and again in the context of COVID-19, uh, we used a COVID-19 open research data set consisting of over 150,000 articles. Uh, we did a subset of those, a little over 50,000 articles, and started mining uh, the content of, of those articles. And we were able to learn a lot about COVID. Uh, we were able to identify cross-cutting topics, and we were able to develop a search engine that allowed others to better access those 50,000 articles. This was done in less than two weeks. And so I think there are just some benefits here and some you know, things that we really wanna pursue when we're working with uh, massive amounts of, of data. There are also limitations. So let's shift slides here. As part of this COVID-19 project, we became acutely aware that it takes a lot for making algorithms analyze words correctly. There can be these subtle ambiguities in our data and the way we use language that can be difficult to capture uh, using machine learning techniques. As the data saw us reminds us, you know, there's often more than one pattern or interpretation that matches our data. Um, and there are also just in the way in which we use language, the meaning of a word is often contingent on the context within, the, with, within which that word is presented. And so that is a real challenge that takes a lot of uh, careful, thoughtful uh, application of, of these kinds of techniques. Again, in the future and as lessons learned emerge from real world examples, I suspect that we'll see an increased attention to these types of issues, but also concrete techniques uh, for, remi for, for sort of solving or tackling and taking on these types of challenges. Uh, not just in terms of amb ambiguity, but also in terms of how to reduce bias, which is also something we're working on uh, here, at, here at Apt Associates.
let's go to the next uh, major trend. Uh, the second major trend that I would like to discuss is uh, that of complexity. Uh, this is not a new trend. It's something that's been brewing for a long time now in evaluation circles. This interest in explaining how and why interventions make a difference is persistent. And over the years, uh, this interest has increasingly been framed in terms of evaluating complex programs in complex settings. And so I think we've made a, a lot of progress in terms of uh, thinking about and identifying and talking about what we mean by complexity the different dimensions of complexity that we would want to consider as part of our evaluations. This includes complexity in relation to the design of the intervention, the delivery of the intervention, and also the outcomes of interventions, as well as the context within which interventions are implemented. So we have sort of worked on these different buckets of complexity, uh, and I think slowly reached a point where we're not only have a more um, clear language around it, although there's still conceptual work to do, but we're also starting to see actual ways of measuring these different types of complexity and bringing it into our evaluation practice. This is so crucial because without unpacking this complexity in our evaluation of the event interventions, we will struggle to fully comprehend and understand what's going on, uh, determine what aspects of it, of the intervention are working or not, and understand whether interventions are playing a positive causal role in bringing about uh, the observed outcomes. Let's go to the next slide, Lauren. Now, from a methods perspective, uh, I think the interest in complexity has been very prevalent in theory-based evaluation and realist evaluation, both of which revolve around this idea of uh, examining the underlying theory of an intervention and explaining how and why it generates more, one or more outcomes of interest. Um, since the publication of Realist Evaluation in 1997, I've through my research seen that the number of published case, ap case applications continue to go up. Uh, the growing range of approaches and methods for explaining how and why interventions work has continued to increase. Um, last year, an entire issue was dedicated of the new directions for evaluation was dedicated to the topic of causal mechanisms, focusing in large part on different ways of understanding uh, the complex causal pathways that leads to an outcome. I've seen a lot of approaches having reviewed and, and uh, over 400 published applications of theory-based and realist evaluation. I see a lot of run-of-the-mill work here, but I also see some truly exciting analytical strategies, coding techniques, and other ways of doing this kind of work, of getting deeper into that inner mechanisms of, of programs and interventions. Let's go to the next slide which brings us right, right back to the IEG guide. Um, over the past 10 years, we've seen a lot of methodological development and application of both case-based, we've seen participatory approaches, and even systems-oriented approaches and methods that are all sort of focusing on getting a better sense of complex causality and complex programs. Now, each of these uh, strategies or approaches, they really offer different ways of understanding and describing the underlying causal logic of interventions. Uh, and of course, there's no sort of right or wrong way, or, you know, I have some personal favorites here, but I also recognize and start seeing that people are really mixing and matching. So I love to see uh, published applications where people are combining different strategies for a more fuller and richer understanding. I think that's where you really start to see some reflective practice. Now, in the, if you're curious about these uh, approaches that I've listed here, uh, they're described in the IEG methods guide. And so there you'll find a brief description, you'll find a description of the procedural steps, you'll see a description of benefits, discussion of benefits and limitation, applicability of the, of the approach, and you'll also see a list of readings and case applications. So again, going back to the Sunday morning, coffee in hand, you just want to be you've been curious about outcome harvesting, this is your go-to source. Now, in the future, let's go to the next slide. I would like to see much more emphasis on how we model interventions. As I mentioned before, I've reviewed over 400 published applications of theory-based and realist evaluations, and I've seen a lot of good work uh, innovative strategies and techniques for developing and testing theories of change. 
many of which are not broadly used. And so I'd really like to see a big emphasis on the, in this area. Um, there are, I'd love to see more practical applications of system mapping dynamics, such as causal loop diagrams. This is something we've been talking about for years, but it's still, we don't have that many worked examples of how this looks in real world practice. Now, I heard through the grapevine that there's a forthcoming volume of new directions of evaluation coming this summer, dedicated entirely to practical examples of uh, evaluations approaches for handling complexity and systems approaches. And I just can't wait. Um, I'll be checking out the new directions for evaluation site every day until that is released. Now, I would also love to see much more consideration to the many different types of outcome trajectories that could be relevant for an intervention. I think all too often in my own practice, I just assume sort of a linear relationship or something close to a linear relationship. But we know, and so my data collection is sort of designed around that assumption, but that's a huge assumption. Mark Lipsy uh, offered these different outcome trajectories back in the 1990s, early 1990s, and there are many more, there are many others. But how often do we actually take these different trajectories into account when we design our evaluations? Maybe it's time to move away from that baseline, midline, and endline style uh, evaluation and sort of rethink how we approach outcome trajectories. I also think we're gonna see a big push towards a, a more component focus in our evaluations. Much of the evaluation that I've conducted in the past has focused on the intervention or program as a whole. I'm now seeing a lot more interest in digging in and trying to get at the critical ingredients within those interventions. What is it that drives the change? Some of the case-based methods, uh, qualitative comparative analysis and process tracing is sort of part of that movement, but I think we'll see a lot more sort of a shift in that direction. Trying to see if there are specific components of programs or interventions or configurations of these that are really driving the impact. And from a practitioner standpoint, that seems particularly relevant and useful to have that level of knowledge. Let's go to the third major trend that I'd like to talk about today. Transformative or using evaluation for transformative change. Over the past few years, there's been an increased attention to the role and purpose of evaluation in times of turbulence. As uh, May and I were working on the EES uh, conference, the last in-person conference before COVID, uh, we were working with this theme of turbulence and uncertainty. And I think this uh, concern or this awareness reflects an increased awareness of the role of evaluation in response to all these global economic crises, climate change and humanitarian crises. I don't necessarily think the world today is more volatile than it used to be, but I think there is this sort of sense in our, in our professional lives and in our personal lives uh, that revolve this feeling of uncertainty. And just to give you a very, very uh, relevant example, the EES, the upcoming EES conference focuses, the theme is on uncertainty. And just yesterday, the conference was uh, postponed until 2022 due to uncertainty. Now there's a close connection between this awareness and the previous trend on complexity and the focus on seeing ourselves as part of a larger system, part of the world and everything that goes on in the world as, evaluate, as an evaluation community. Evaluators now see ourselves as a complex system. It's not just our individual practice, we're part of something much bigger, and it, we have an obligation in that way to actually try to bring about transformative change. I think this trend also signifies a renewed focus on the ethical dimension of evaluation and a commitment to transformative change in that, through that ethical obligation. The evaluation is no longer an objective conveyor of information, someone who just provides the information for decision makers. We actually are active contributors to the design and implementation of the intervention, in some cases, and active contributors to whether we bring about, do more good and less harm. Let's go to the next slide, because it's safe to say that this role as an active contributor is nothing new to evaluation. We have a long history of participatory approaches, both in international development, but also in other areas of evaluation practice. We've all we've taken on this role in the context of adaptive management, 
Michael Patton's uh, developmental evaluation. If you're in the health sciences, you might have engaged in improvement science. All of these are really uh, evaluation approaches, activities that are revolve around active involvement and continuous learning and improvement of the intervention of the program. And these approaches have, you know, over the years gained great traction and will continue to gain traction. But I think there's also a more subtle shift if we go to the next slide, because it's not just about being part of improving and continuous learning in the context of an intervention. In 2019, Ideas published this excellent book on evaluation for transformational change. Each chapter proposes different ways of for evaluation to be transformative and to take that on that role at different levels. Um, and I would say, you know, Sunday, of course, you'll be sitting with the IAG methods book and coffee in hand, but maybe the Sunday after that, this would be the book for you to pick up and, and sort of browse through. Because I think over the next years, I suspect we'll see an increased focus on, on this transformative uh, uh, aspect of evaluation, both the po potential, the benefits, and the limitations. In more sort of terms of tools and methods, I suspect we'll see an increased focus on foresight, on trying to see ahead of time and try to gain what kinds of scenarios, what are the intended and unattended scenarios and consequences of interventions that we engage with. I think there'll be an increased push in this direction. Um, just last week, I think there was a 365 post by um, an evaluator, Julia Lynn, uh, that I haven't had a chance to to meet or talk with, but she made a really compelling case for including including foresight tools into theory-based evaluation. So using scenario maps instead of the traditional theories of change. And I think we're going to see some methods work in this area. Uh, we should look to intelligence analysts like the CIA has started publishing on their methods. And the you know intelligence analysts are the expert at this game because their whole uh, profession is around predicting adverse consequences and scenarios and reducing bias in their work. So if you're interested in this topic, I would strongly recommend that you start looking into the CIA publications. This might be the closest thing you'll ever be to a secret agent, um, but there's a lot to learn from that community of practitioners. And we tend not to tap into their work, but they're making it available. Now, others are also starting to really do some interesting work on incorporating adverse consequences in our theories of change, uh, which is also, I think, a very exciting idea that I'll be working on um, over this next year, how to do that in a way that, that makes sense and, and is uh, rigorous and, and, and provides worthwhile results. The questions of, are we doing good? I I think will also be directed at the consequences of our evaluations. Are we as evaluators doing more harm than good? Um, I know this is another area that people at Rockefeller Foundation, there's a group of uh, people, Veronica, Rodney Hobson, I think Stephen Porter might be involved in this, but they're right now doing a big sort of research project on the adverse consequences of evaluation in international development settings. And I think it's really going to provide us with a nice stepping stone for advancing our consequent, uh, our conversation and awareness of the consequences of our own practice. So very exciting uh, developments in that area. Let's go to the next slide. I think another thing that we'll, we'll see, and if you haven't heard about this yet, you surely will. Uh, Michael Patton has worked in this global initiative around blue marble evaluation. Uh, Blue Marble Evaluation is this global initiative uh, that really focuses on training the next generation of evaluators to think globally, act globally, and evaluate globally. You can see how this falls into this broader trend of complexity and systems thinking at the global level. Uh, and this is a, something that I see and hear more about at conferences, and I haven't seen it sort of weaved into practice just yet, but it's definitely a, a a movement and idea that is gaining a lot of momentum. Um, of course, coming from Michael Patton is rooted, rooted in utilization-focused evaluation and principles-based evaluation. 
and it's really focusing on systems thinking at the global level and transformation. So our ability to transform systems for a more sustainable and equi equi equitable future. Tall order for the evaluator, I know. But the idea here is that it's a community taking this on. Let's go to the next slide. Real world evaluation is demanding. There's so much that can happen in the space between the initial design and actual implementation of an evaluation. As seasoned evaluators, we know that, we're well aware of that. Ideally, evaluation questions drive the mythological decisions. We're informed by stakeholders, we mix methods and approaches, but we also have to attend to the context and we always have to adapt our approaches and methods to the real world constraints of budgets, time, data access, and the messiness of life. Quality evaluation is less about rigor by design and more about rigor and thinking in this way. And that leaves the evaluator in a tough, tough role. We started as ME, M and E practitioners, monitoring and evaluation practitioners. But since then, we have just worked our way through a whole host of different, increasingly complex acronyms. Let's go to the next slide, Lauren. So from the early day of m and &E, we're just working our way through a dizzying array of acronyms. The order gets taller and taller. And we've now reached the level of Merlin. We are literally expected to be wizards. It's the Harry Potter era of evaluation, perhaps. I don't know, but I do know that if we keep going at this rate, we will run out of letters. <laughs> um, but it's not just semantics, right? There's a fundamental shift here in the role and purpose of evaluators, individually and collectively. Um, in sort of trying to navigate my own practice and improve my own practice, I've been heavily influenced by Thomas Swann and his notion of reflective practice. Swann argues in his book that competent evaluation requires cultivating a life of the mind for practice. We need to reach beyond being good technicians to become reflective practitioners. And I agree. I think our evaluation should never just be reduced to technical exercises with plug and play methods and approaches, ritualistic development of key performance indicators and lock frames without logic. I think we really need to push ourselves and push our practice into the area of situated judgment, critical thinking and reflection, not just in methodological terms, but also in, in ethical terms. And it is exactly this type of reflective practice that will help us steer through the contextual uncertainties, the ambiguities, the indeterminacies, and all the subtleties and limitations that we face in our practice. I think Swan's reflective practice provides a rich backdrop for the kind of dialogue that we as practitioners should have and engage in and about the future of evaluation, of moving from rigor and design to rigor and thinking. And on that note, I will pass on the torch to Betsy. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Um, that was really interesting. And I'm sure I speak for everyone on this webinar when I say that I would like a framed version of that Metro map for the wall in my office. Um, that's just fantastic. Um, so when I got asked to speak on this um, panel and reflect on some of what Sebastian was going to talk about, it got me thinking about um, the space that I work in, which is mainly the US funded donor space. So on evaluations for USAID, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the State Department, um, CDC, et cetera, et cetera, um, different agencies that do international development work of different types. And how do we take advantage of new methods, continue to explore and get the most out of them um, in that context? And what are the challenges when we try to do that? Um, the, the context that we're operating in in that, in that space is um, that most US agencies have an evaluation policy that 
is fairly narrow, I would say, and fairly rigid that defines two main types of evaluation, either impact evaluation or performance evaluation. And um, most of the um, evaluation that gets commissioned falls in one of those two categories. And I think the methods that Sebastian is talking about and the trends vary a lot in their compatibility with those two evaluation types, but there are a lot of ways that they can be applied. Um, and I think at the edges, we're starting to see more movement toward experimentation and newer approaches. So um, Sebastian mentioned the USAID's Merlin contract, which um, is a mechanism testing and, and developing approaches for rapid cycle evaluation, um, uh, evaluating complexity um, and a couple of other different um, and newer things. There's also um, a USAID and, and DFID collaboration, global learning for adaptive management that, um, that focused on developing the, the systems and complexity aspect of evaluation. Um, so we're, I think we're starting to see more of that at the edges, especially as systems thinking picks up as a trend, not only in evaluation, but also on the program design and implementation side, because as an industry, we're realizing that if we're trying to design programs um, in complex environments and take that um, complexity into our design, then our evaluation methods also have to follow. They have to be able to um, understand that context as well and operate within it. So, why do we want to do this in the first place? It's uh, not for its own sake, um, but evaluation in general and also innovation and new ways of learning. We want to improve programming. We want accountability, um, you know, all kinds of reasons that we do evaluation. So thinking about that in the US funded space, what are the constraints to taking advantage of some of the things that Sebastian was talking about? Um, I don't think I'm the first person to point out that for USAID in, in particular, there's a lot of rigidity in the contracting structure. So there's been an enormous emphasis on CLA, collaborating, learning, and adapting over the past five, 10 years. Um, but there's a real tension between real-time learning and adapting on one side and the contractual realities of standard indicators and uh, mandated um, you know, con contractually mandated targets. So um, this is a big ship in the USAID case, and it's it's hard to change course. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that adaptive management is happening, but it may be on a smaller scale than what we sometimes see other donors um, able to do in the UK, and especially in Australia, where um, in that case, I think we see a lot more openness in the programming and and a lot more a lot less um certainty at the beginning about where we want to end up um so thinking about how do we you know how do we incorporate what's good about that but make it compatible with the contracting structures we have in the us um is something i want to think about more um i also i also wanted to raise a question about how we think about evaluation on one hand versus um, m e or monitoring and adaptive management on the other because um, at least in the in the donor funded space those things tend to be somewhat siloed right so often a program will have um, and you know an m e team that's in charge of project monitoring and collecting data and using that data to do adaptive management to the extent that they can and CLA and then a separate contract will be issued for an independent evaluation. And sometimes those, um, those two entities have different interests, have different incentives. Um, but I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is how is that separation serving us? And is rethinking that model a little bit um, useful or appropriate in terms of being able to make use of a little bit more um, of these innovative methods that Sebastian was talking about, because we, you know, we we have inefficiencies. I think 
We have evaluators who aren't necessarily steeped in the um, the day to day programming, and we have MEL staff on programs that don't necessarily have the same skill sets as evaluators. And I think there would be a benefit to um, to to more dialogue and more collaborating. But I think um, then there's also a question of objectivity and evaluation independence. So I just wanted to raise some of these issues that I've been thinking about. And um, like an evaluator, I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of thoughts, um, but I'm not claiming to have any answers. I just, uh, I, I wanted to come to this and, and hopefully raise some questions. Um, and finally, I guess what I'd like to maybe hear from the audience a little bit is that I see a lot of people from the NGO space. And I think that in that space, we might see more overlap between the two, um, you know, the MEL side and the evaluation side. And I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, how we see that working and whether there are lessons that we think that could be applied to, um, you know, the maybe more rigid, large donor funded project side of things. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mbuso. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Betsy, for for those insights, um, and also thanks to uh, Sebastian. Uh, so just to kickstart my uh, sort of like uh, thoughts uh, from the UK perspectives as well, um, I'll, I'll just take you back a little bit uh, uh, to the then DFID uh, in 2012. So DFID um, commissioned a study to try and explore. Um, a wide range of um, evaluation methods and designs. I think there was this sort of like uh, uh, push towards, uh, you know, the randomized control trials, but it turned out that in terms of the context, really only 5% of the programs were suitable for RCTs. But when you, uh, so they wanted to understand what are the alternatives. So uh, the task was to prove that we have alternative um, you know, um, evaluation methods that have sort of like the same rigor, uh, but are different. And uh, uh, that study actually pointed towards, you know, theory based evaluations. There was an increase in appetite as well for, you know, case based studies um, and um, still the need to, for, for um, I think, programs and donors to want to do, uh, you know, more of causal inferences or attribution uh, at a higher level. Um, fast forward 2020, uh, we saw a merger between uh, DFID and uh, our, our FCO uh, to form FCDO, and this happened in September. Um, so what simple that means is that there was now um, an emphasis or a more close link between development and trade uh, and diplomacy. Um, then that sort of like also calls for a rigor in terms of, you know, what benefits, how can we maximize the impact, you know, from the uh, pound we spend, especially on the most uh, uh, vulnerable populations. Um, so there is sort of like now an increase in terms of uh, scrutiny, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, demonstrating that uh, we have, uh, you know, the best uh, benefits from these uh, interventions or programs. Uh, but uh, looking at the year 2019, 2020, um, looking across all the, you know, the dev checker, the evaluations that were done, 50% uh, of the evaluations were uh, impact evaluations, close to 50%, and 43% were performance evaluations, and just a small percentage were was more focused on processes. Um, so we also realized that, you know, with the advent of the COVID-19, uh, the context has uh, tremendously changed. It, it's getting more complex and um, everything is tightly intertwined now. Um, and for us to still continue, let's say, wanting to do causal inferences is getting even more difficult. So it's a task now for evaluators to try and split the hairs and sort of like understand, you know, um, how, how did we, what sort of impact did we make and how did we arrive at that? Uh, next slide. Um, so I think I'll also uh, 
touching on some points that were raised by Sebastian there, uh, one of the key issues we face, I think, in the evaluation space, uh, I'll go back to the challenges that we are facing at the moment and try and see if these challenges, uh, you know, the, the burden is lessened by some of these methods or, you know, the modern methods that are upcoming. So one of the challenges we face is, you know, the powered sample sizes where you would want to disaggregate your data, calculate statistical significance um, with a I think uh, uh, sort of like, you know, budgets that we do have, especially I, I see most people there in the NGO space, it's challenging. Um, the other thing we also face is, uh, you know, carrying out interventions and also evalu evaluating uh, some of these interventions uh, in terms of hard to reach places. So it's hard to reach places as well as hard to reach uh, sort of like marginalized communities. Uh, how do we resolve some of these uh, challenges? Do these methods uh, provide some insights? Um, then we also have another challenge in terms of uh, where we can't do a randomized controlled trials. Uh, how can we find the best, you know, um, sort of like uh, comparative groups? Uh, hopefully now with the, you know, proliferation of uh, technologies, they should be a quicker way of uh, you know using some analytical methods methods or data science to find the best matches quickly. Um, then the other part we've seen some evaluations taking three months. Um, you know it, it it depends really, but um, I think we're still uh, sort of like uh, lagging behind in terms of providing real time data analysis and uh, you know you're looking at also COVID nineteen. People want to know what's happening as soon as possible so that we, they can make informed decisions. So as long as these methods and approaches sort of like help uh, sort of like lessen the burden, then I think we are sort of like in the in the right direction. And uh, if you can next. Uh, the other point I want to uh, touch on is uh, that uh, Sebastian raised is on more uh, on the uh, complexity and also, you know, the turbulent times that we are in. Um, Obviously, the way we see uh, problems um, when we design our interventions, um, it's getting more complex and they will in turn require complex interventions. And complex interventions will also require, you know, complex uh, evaluation methods to be able to sort of like decode some of these complexities. And I believe um, if we uh, master the art or the science of, uh, you know, mixing these methods, uh, you know, in the same way, you know, when we say mixing, mix methods from qualitative and quantitative, but at this higher level, it's more mixing, you know, the various methods so that you get the best out of them. And um, we should be able to understand or decode some of these, uh, understand some complex causations there and how we sort of like have these multiple, um, you know, pathways to uh, reaching a, a single outcome, issues leading to uh, equifinality. Next point. Um, the other point I would like to touch on is, um, you know, we always have this, um, Sebastian spoke of, you know, we have this linear way of saying there's a best line, there's a midline, there's an end line. Um, and in most cases, as evaluators, we rely on the monitoring team to say, okay, you'll give us the monitoring data so that we can plug in and find the missing middle. And the missing middle in most cases is always hard to connect to or dovetail to these, you know, best line and 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 and, and midline or end line. So it's it's always a struggle. But uh, I think with the growth in terms of uh, use of uh, uh, big data where you can collect some longitudinal data right from the beginning, you should be able to also, you know, generate or cover the gap of, you know, where there's lack of monitoring data. And also there's the adaptive programming as well that is sort of like increasingly becoming more popular where every time, every quarter, you know, interventions get adapted as long as you have good enough quantum of evidence uh, to be able to uh, make a decision that you need to change something, 
uh, you go and uh, change it. Uh, but now what it means is that you don't have a non-linear uh, sort of like um, way of, you know, getting to where you want to get to. So there is a need to be able to also unpack that. Uh, and hopefully uh, the estimation of our effect sizes or the impact uh, will be more accurate. Uh, the next point. Um, when we design, uh, when we develop our theories of change and, you know, uh, log frames, we always refer to the context as the king. And uh, I think as evaluators, we should also, even though we will not be part of the design, we should also understand that context is the king. And um, I think one of the things is also there is a growth or appetite as well in, uh, you know, payment by results programs, especially in the NGO sector or payment for success. Um, in the middle of the program, when there is, um, you know, some of these, uh, you know, uh, risks that you have identified, for example, COVID-19 hits in the middle of the intervention. How can you best estimate, you know, your impact and at what point can, you know, things happened, but I, I believe with, you know, big data, you are able to, uh, track back and say, I think at this point we had so much gains and these gains were displaced by this negative effect at some point, and we can accurately sort of like make those connections. Uh, next point. I think in conclusion, really, uh, just to give people time in conclusion, I think uh, these emerging sort of like uh, methods and approaches. Um, like, uh, the, the hybrid approaches, the rapid cycle evaluations, big data, um, they help us unpack the context deeper and better. Uh, and actually help us even improve the effect size estimations. Um, and they give us alternatives as well in terms of that pyramid of evidence where we have, you know, the RCTs at the peak, but I think we are adding some flesh with a combination of uh, methods, but there is still some caution in terms of applicability of some of these. I think both in terms of capacity, uh, we have traditional evaluators who uh, are slow in adopting this technology in data science. We also still have to uh, understand uh, deeply in terms of, you know, big data, how do we manage the movement of data, uh, uh, either between countries or from point A to point B still upholding the evaluation principles. Um, I'll stop here for now and over to you, uh, Laura. Wonderful. Thank you. So we, we have only 5 minutes for. Um, answering questions that you might submit and if you have questions, please do submit them in the chat box to, to the panel. Um, but we also would like to take this opportunity to, to give you uh, the chance to answer some questions for us that we can follow up on after the webinar is over. Um, and I've posed those questions here and um, they include what, what do you think is the most important evaluation trend? Um, and are there trends that you think that we have missed? Uh, so if you want to, uh, when you answer those questions for us in the chat, um, if you want to number them one and two, we can, um, we can um, amass that information. And then third, we would like to know from you as well, what topics you would like us to address in future webinars. So if you have an answer to that question, you can number it three. Um, unnumbered questions for us will, um, or uh, elements in the, in the chat will give us an opportunity to um, address any questions that you have. The couple that came in um, during the, the presentation, one of them was about COVID, and I included in the chat some links to, to the COVID work that we have been doing at APT, and it is substantial. Um, but in particular, there's a, a ask, uh, ask an Expert video series that I shared a link with there where um, uh, I have an entry in that where I discuss specifically um, this was really at the outset of the pandemic. Um, how are we supposed to be thinking about our evaluations in, in this time when, uh, you know, uh, those of you familiar with the concept of threats to the internal validity will know that um, that a major global event like the COVID-19 pandemic, um, both health wise as well, well, as well as environmentally and uh, socially 
economically, educationally. Um, it's uh, creating, it's wreaking havoc on our neat and tidy evaluations, um, and the evaluations have to be able to deal with that uh, complexity and uncertainty, right, in, in the way that um, Sebastian put that um, tsunami wave coming at us. So, I don't see any specific targeted questions for the panelists, but we will leave the chat open for the next couple of minutes to allow you to reflect on the answers to the questions that we've posed about uh, trends and our future. So here's a, a question coming in from Gordon Freer. Um, he says, recognizing the community of evaluation extends beyond evaluators. What thoughts do we have on how to communicate? I think that's a really important issue. Um, how do we communicate useful and purposeful changes to those who might be on the periphery of the community and may not understand uh, the complexities? Um, so I, I'll turn that back to our panelists. Do any of you have some keen insights on how we can better communicate to varied, varied audiences of the information that we glean through evalu our evaluation work? So just as a backdrop here, Gordon and I, Gordon was the person that introduced me to evaluation in international development uh, after the publication of DFIT's broadening the impact designs. Um, I was hired to work with Gordon on theory-based evaluation of market development programs in Ghana and Nigeria. Um, so good to, good to see that you're out there, Gordon. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, I think in terms of um, promoting uh, these different um, approaches and designs and how we conduct evaluation, it used to be that a lot of this was centered at like the European Evaluation Society and the big journals. I think that's changing. I see a lot more uh, local evaluation uh, interest organizations coming up across the world, uh, national organizations and even below national. And um, so I think a lot of this work is becoming much less centered around these um, European uh, uh, hot spots of sharing information about how to conduct evaluation. So I think that's a very positive trend that goes in the direction of getting to some of the practitioners and people that are either doing or commissioning evaluation at the periphery. I don't necessarily think they're at the periphery because they're actually doing the practice, um, but at the periphery of the more sort of um, the community of evaluators that attend EES conferences. Um, so I think that's a strong, strong, uh, these local organizations are key. Well, thank you, Sebastian. That takes us to the top of the hour. I want to let our audience know that we will be sharing resources from, from this session. And uh, so stay tuned for that. We have all of your email addresses from your registration. And I wanna thank you for engaging with us today on this topic and look forward to more engagement with you in the future.